Let's bring in our panel now and in London. We have Metrad Khonsari. He is a former Iranian diplomat and senior consultant for the Paris-based Iranian Center for Policy Studies. In Washington, Thomas Countryman. He served as Assistant Secretary of State for International Security and Nonproliferation under President Barack Obama. And joining us from Philadelphia, Michael Johns, a former White House speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush and a co-founder of the conservative Tea Party movement. Thanks all three of you so much for joining us. Mahdad, let me start with you. Trump said pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal isn't just good for America. It's good for the people of Iran because it is bad for the Iranian government. Do you think that's true? Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that to be the case. The people of Iran were hoping that in the aftermath of the signing of this agreement, that uh, that would serve as a first step for Iran's gradual reintegration into the international community. They were hopeful that uh, funds, uh, money would start rolling into the country, technology will come, there would be jobs, that the economy would improve, inflation would be sort of dealt with, and issues of that nature. Now, they are the victims of uh, this situation going from bad to worse and for their miseries to be okay. sort of becoming prolonged. And in the case of those Iranians who thought that perhaps President Trump was intending or was bent on trying to promote regime change and were hopeful that this signified, you know, something in that direction, uh, it was clear in his message, at the end of his message, when he said that uh, he is he appealed to the Iranian leaders that if they were ever ready for making for wanting to make a new deal that he would be ready willing and able to sort of uh, embark on a new course leading to a new you might say uh, more broader deal with them so uh, prospects of regime change can hardly be advanced if he is in negotiation with the current ruling establishment. So, uh, in overall, I don't think that uh, any Iranian, for patriotic reasons uh, alone, to, to, to sort of be bullied in this direction uh, it can be pleased, even if there are aspects of uh, President Trump's message that might uh, be appealing to them. Okay. Michael Johns, let me ask you. Uh, uh, first of all, do you agree with Trump that, that it will be good for the Iranian people? And I mean, ultimately, does it even matter to the American public if it serves Iran or not? Because it's America first, as far as many of Trump's supporters are concerned. Right. First and foremost, the deal was horrible and horribly constructed in every respect and really placed Iran on a path to nuclear weapons development, in addition to lifting sanctions and affording uh, this regime, which is the largest uh, state sponsor of terrorism in the world, vast billions of dollars. I do not believe that this agreement was supported by the Iranian people, and that's not a subjective view. There's been lots of statements that have come out of opposition uh, organizations and figures uh, from Iran that have uh, celebrated and supported President Trump's decision. Um, a lot of internal support that has gotten out, even in the last 24 hours, applauding this agreement. This was an agreement not be even between the government of the United States. It was, a government, it was an agreement really between one singular president and, a re and an undemocratic totalitarian regime that is repressing okay. rights and fomenting uh, chaos and terrorism throughout the region. So the, getting rid of this agreement ultimately is beneficial for the world. It's beneficial for security interests of the United States and our allies and the region. It's been supported by many Arab governments throughout the region. And it's ultimately beneficial to the people of Iran because it places the people of Iran and our relationship with them above this regime that does not represent them. Okay. Thomas Countryman, if I can, I'd like to move the conversation a little forward with you. One of the other points that was raised here is that pulling out of this agreement actually pits the United States against its very closest allies. And now we have the European Union saying, we will preserve this deal for the sake of our own collective security. So where does this leave the United States now on 
the international front if it's made enemies, in a sense, with its closest allies? Well, first of all, this was not a deal just between the United States and Iran. There were seven countries that were partners, including the three most important allies of the United States, Britain, Germany, and France. The decision by President Trump to violate the deal, which is a more accurate word than to say to withdraw, leaves six countries that are still committed to the deal. And I hope that they will remain committed because it is in the interests of the U.S. and of regional security, and in the interest of keeping Iran from developing a nuclear weapon, that this deal be upheld. <clears throat> there is, I share the same concern that the President and all of our friends in Europe and all of our friends in the Middle East have about Iran's destabilizing activities. The President has chosen a course of putting maximum economic pressure on Iran as a means of trying to change that behavior. There is a legitimate disagreement as to whether that's the most effective means to change behavior, or can you build on the agreement that is working to stop Iran from having nuclear weapons and extend your cooperation, negotiations, deals to other areas. And that's where we come to the all the other side effects that I think the president has not fully considered. Number one is, as you mentioned, a direct conflict between the United States and its most important allies in Europe. Right. And with the president's threat to sanction not just the regime, but European companies as well. And I mean, Thomas, if you can, speak, speak briefly, if you can, on how those sanctions could actually work. You're saying that the, our, the European allies should stick with this deal as best they can, but if the threat of sanctions is there, and that threat is obviously very real, how could that even work? Well, I'm not certain it would work. The uh, decision by the president to violate the deal does not in itself kill the JCPOA, but it is a very severe injury to the agreement. I think what's important for especially the Europeans is to say we believe in sticking to commitments and agreements that we have made, and we will stand up in defense of an agreement that is working that has removed 90 percent of Iran's enriched uranium, removed 75 percent of its centrifuges, taken us much further okay. along a path that ensures Iran will never get there. It's important for Europe's credibility to stand up in defense of the deal. Perhaps it is, but uh, Michael Johns, let me ask you, I mean, the United States has done this and Trump will stick by it. Um, so tell us, how far is the United States, should the United States be willing to go to punish its European allies for breaking, breaking the sanctions, not that just that are already there, but the sanctions that will come, that will punish their businesses for going forward with the deals they've already made under the agreement that was signed in 2015? Well, I don't think there's been a definitive decision yet by uh, the three predominant European signatories of this. We'll work closely with them in an attempt to restructure an agreement that actually prohibits, not for 10 years, but in the perpetuity, the development of nuclear weapons uh, in Iran. And hopefully that can be done. If it cannot be done, however, and this has been certainly the case largely it's been taken with North Korea as well, then you need tough, universal, broadly applied sanctions and a position of unequivocal intolerance for the development of nuclear weapons. This, um, by the way, the, I think it was a great intellectual uh, question when the agreement was signed as to what sort of effect it would have on Iran's behavior in the world. And many of us listened a little bit incredulously to uh, President Obama's prediction that it would improve uh, those engagements, it did just the opposite. The reality is terrorist activity throughout the world uh, with Iran's involvement has accelerated, not decelerated. Their engagement in all sorts of uh, malicious activity, anti-American rhetoric, direct conflict with uh, the United States in several respects has accelerated. So okay. the agreement did not have the intended effect on Iran's behavior. It would have been intriguing, I think, if, if that had happened, 
we may not have had the development that we did yesterday. Okay. But I think it's very consistent with Iran's underlying uh, position. Let me ask uh, Merdad about that point. I mean, it is fair. Critics of the deal, Merdad, have have said that since it was signed in 2015, we've seen an even more aggressive and militarily active Iran in the Middle East. We look at Yemen, Syria, uh, Iraq, even Lebanon. Ha has the deal emboldened Iran since 2015, or would Iran really have been doing this anyway? I think that the deal has nothing to do with any of these issues that uh, this gentleman is talking about. Uh, the deal was supposed to curtail Iran's nuclear activities, stop uh, the spread of proliferation in the region, which it has succeeded in doing. There, there is discussion about the fact that the sunset clause uh, is something disagreeable, but there is no uh, indication in any part of this deal that once this deal comes to a conclusion that Iran can resume uh, where it left off and go after a nuclear deal. And many of these European countries who were in direct negotiation with Iran over this particular issue were adamant that some sort of talk should begin within the uh, par parameters of the current uh, JCPOA to ensure against such an outcome once we reach the end of the end of the line. But when you talk about malign influence or uh, Iran's, first of all, Iran being the largest state sponsor of terrorism, first you have to, be, you have to remind your audiences that the, the problem that we are facing today is not with state sponsors of terrorism, but with a non-state. ISIS is not a state. Al-Qaeda is not a state, according to all the American intelligence organizations and, you know, uh, government officials, they are the ones that are the main, you know, the main problems. And also, when it comes to malign influence, I mean, I'm, I have been a critic of the Iranian regime for the past 40 years, and I, there is no way that I in any way uh, validate the way that they have acted. But nobody can claim to have a monopoly on virtue and monopoly on good behavior. Problems in the Middle East that exist today, the wars in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, and, and Yemen, they were not instigated by Iran. They were all instigated by other people who left, who started something, then left, created a vacuum, created this mayhem from which the Iranian regime has been able to benefit. Now, I think okay. that there's a legitimate reason to discuss these things with them, but you don't discuss these issues by uh, sort of relinquishing the moral high ground and giving them the opportunity to have the support of the international okay. community over uh, failure on the part of yourself. Okay, Thomas, let me ask you this. I mean, I've, I, my own observation is that the last time we saw this kind of discord between the United States and its European allies uh, over a foreign policy issue was when France and Germany in particular disagreed very strongly about uh, where the U.S. was going in the lead up to the war in Iraq. Does the U.S. want to be there again? Does it want to be that much at odds with its most important allies on the planet? Well, clearly most of the United States does not want to be there. The latest public opinion surveys show that more than 60 percent of Americans believe that the U.S. should have stayed within the JCPOA. But you're right that I see echoes that concern me. History does not repeat itself, but it does sometimes rhyme. And what we're seeing is, again, a <clears throat> misuse of intelligence to make claims about weapons programs that simply do not exist. And we see one of the key actors, Mr. Bolton, who was one of the primary advocates for the war in Iraq and one of the primary misusers of intelligence information, and one who has spoken and written repeatedly about the need for the U.S. to take military action against Iran, is again in a position of power. And that concerns me greatly, because I do see scenarios under which the, by a series of missteps, provocations and counter-provocations starting from either side, we could again find ourselves in a disastrous conflict in the Middle East, just as we did in 2003. Okay. And please don't forget one thing. 
the number one event that has done more to increase Iran's influence in the Middle East more than any other event was the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Michael Johns, do you see any of the same parallels that Thomas has pointed out there? Not really, no, because the uh, operating assumption with that argument is that we're in some status quo, amicable relationship with Iran right now. The reality is they just provided a missiles that were you know, launched at Riyadh. They were funding greatly Hezbollah and Hamas, which are uh, destabilizing uh, the region. They have prohibited our inspections in multiple ways. Uh, both prohibiting us from looking at military f facilities in Iran where they logically would develop nuclear weapons, providing, you know, weak But the IAEA has had full notice, access, Michael. Which you would only do, which you would, oh, just to finish, if you would only do that if you were trying to conceal weapons development. Um, so really, what we're looking at right now is, is potentially restructuring, hopefully, an agreement that actually does preclude Iran from developing nuclear weapons. And part of that, the spirit of that agreement, maybe not the technical uh, components of it, but the spirit of it, should it include some degree of improvement in um, our relationship okay. uh, with that government and that government's uh, rethinking of its behavior. Uh, Thomas, very quickly, I mean, we're hearing uh, Michael refer to the potential restructuring of the agreement, but it was in interesting when I heard Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts say that actually Trump has just burnt down the house uh, when he could have just remodeled the kitchen. So is there still potential for restructuring this deal so that all can get back on board? There may be, but I've heard no strategy whatsoever from the White House about how to do that. And the difficulty with making a new agreement is that you make agreements with people that you trust. If the United States, under President Trump, develops the habit of repealing and not replacing, as it's done domestically on a few issues, as it did with the Paris Climate Agreement, and now it's done with the JCPOA, it's hard for me to argue to any world leader that making a deal with Donald Trump is worth the paper that it's printed on. Okay. U.S. credibility has been destroyed. And as an American diplomat for more than 30 years, it's shocking to me to see that Iran has more credibility in this instance than the United States does. Okay, Thomas Countryman, I'll have to give you the last word because very unfortunately we are completely out of time for this segment. I'd like to thank all three of you so much for joining us. And we'll take a short break, but stay with us because Israel's former Knesset speaker and peace activist Avram Borg will join us to discuss Israel's position on the Iran nuclear deal as well as the state of Israel's liberal opposition.